Hello, and welcome to Scrapcraft. I'd like to tell you a story. The story of Hephaestus and the Ancient Verge. Made with only the most immediate natural resources, as is almost always the case with ancient craft, the Verge was the heart of the ancient workshop and was capable of reaching temperatures in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, similar to that of molten lava. More than a tool, it is a home for fire. The Greeks often referred to fire as Hephaestus, after the god of fire and craftsmanship. They correlated the two because they believed fire was the origin of all art, and it makes sense that they believed so, because not only could the forge be used for blacksmithing, but it could also melt metals for casting into tools and various other objects, or even be used for various chemical processes that require high heat, such as calcification. Many pigments for paints, even, were made by roasting compounds on the forge. It's truly an amazing tool. I was personally inspired by a number of terracotta artifacts from ancient Greece and other Mediterranean civilizations. It's clear terracotta is the material of choice for this project. Countless examples of ancient furnaces, ovens, stoves still exist to this day as a testament to its durability and its heat resistance. I'll make my terracotta from wild clay. My workshop rests on an exposed patch of clay, making this resource immediately available to me. All that's required of me is to dig into the frozen ground. Clay like this that occurs naturally in a state suitable to mold and firm bricks with was called brick earth in the old days and will require no refinement, at least not for a curse application like bricks and my unskilled hands. However, if you're unable to find clay of sufficient purity, don't fear. It's not too hard to refine lower purity clay sources into almost pure clay. If anyone's curious, I can make a follow-up video about how this is done. But otherwise, I would guide you to Andy Ward's Ancient Pottery channel. It's chocked full of knowledge on how to find and use wild clay, and he's far, far more experienced than I am. I'll put a link in the description. Now that I've harvested my clay, I need to hydrate it and break up the clumps. Because it's frozen, I used boiling water for this task. But believe it or not, the clay was still frigid to my bare hands as I needed it to distribute the moisture. After an hour or so of soaking and occasional kneading, I bagged it and stirred it inside to finish hydrating by itself over the course of about 72 hours. I brought it inside as it's crucial it not be allowed to freeze during this time or I'll have to start all over again. While there are countless historical examples of forges, more than anything, I drew the actual design for my forge from ancient Egyptian brazier forge, the mural of craftsmen in the tomb of Nebuman and Epuki was by far the most important resource in infirming my design. Not only is it a depiction of a forge, but it depicts how it would have been operated and even what its use would have been in the context of the workshop. This mural is invaluable to me. The mural dates to around 1350 BC, making it well over 3000 years old. And certainly the brazier forge design itself is older than that. The forge is small, no larger than the stool the operator sits on, and at about the same level. It's an elegant design, a brazier with a wide, shallow bowl with a single leg. The color it's painted indicates it's likely made of earthenware, and perhaps is similar in design to this smaller brazier that was found in King Tutankhamun's tomb. As I don't have the skill or knowledge of craft as of yet to firm a full brazier, I decided to emulate the shape with a set of custom terracotta bricks with a low rising rim. I firmed my clay into a circle and divided the circle into quarters with a fifth central piece. So as you can see, <laughs> the Forge suddenly looks very different. Unfortunately, while I was making it, my battery died, and as you can see, I added all these grooves, I split it into sections, and I built up these walls around. So essentially, these are what will contain the forge. This gives you a back wall to blow against. Um, it was pretty simple to construct, but I'll show you basically how I made these walls, just with um, showing you how I made these brick inserts that will basically restrict the size of the forge for specific applications so that I can be more fuel efficient. 
along with Andy Ward's channel mentioned earlier. A great resource for these techniques is the Potted History channel. It's absolutely loaded with demonstrations of how ancient pottery, actual artifacts, were firmed, both by hand and on wheels. Now that the clay is firmed, it needs to dry. This will take about a week because the parts are pretty thick, but I can't quite relax yet, as I've got a few other things to make to get ready for the forge. The first is a pair of tongs to manipulate metal with. I'm going to be making mine from oak wood. This oak came from a tree that was struck by lightning, <laughs> not once, but actually twice. So I feel confident in saying Zeus gave me these tongs. Wood may seem like a strange material for making tongs that will be routinely plunged into the heart of a fire that's glowing at molten lava temperatures, but there's actually a lot of evidence for the ancient use of wooden tongs, and I was personally inspired by their use to smell copper on the Ancient Craft channel by Dr. James Dilly. It's a fantastic and informative video, as is always the case with that channel, and I'll link to it in the description. I found ancient technology is routinely more about the techniques used by the operator more than the actual apparatus itself. And a perfect example of that is the wooden tongs. By dunking these tongs in water immediately before use, they'll be temporarily gifted a resistance to the extreme heat. Some of you may have seen videos of metal workers slapping molten metal with wet hands, demonstrating the same principle. I even used this principle with my own hand when I want to quickly move hot fuel around in the fire. But it's important to note the effect is very brief and shouldn't be over relied on. After solving the flammability problem, otherwise, oak is the perfect material for a pair of tongs. It's very springy and is easy to work with and is kind to your tools. I'm still very new to woodworking, so such a forgiving material was a pleasant lesson. I start by firming a plank, and as far as the tools I use to shape this wood are concerned, almost all save the wood rasp, were common in antiquity. Chisels, adzes, and saws, working wood, are depicted in the very same mural as the brazier forge itself, and the fact that these same tools exist today in modern workshops speaks volumes. I found a wonderful Roman mosaic depicting the mythological Greek inventor Daedalus and his son Icarus, firming planks using the very same tools I have in my shop. The Egyptian adze substituted for an axe, just as I have. The mosaic even shows a wood plane. It may be silly, but seeing this gave me a feeling of connection to the humans in our past, and learning more about woodworking has really showed me just how elegant simple tools can be, and has driven me to want to improve to be more worthy of the wood I'm working. It's clear deft hands could truly make marvels with a lot less than I have. Now that I've made the plank, I'm going to carve it down into tongs, starting by drawing out the shape I want using some quick and simple measurements. Then I chisel off the bulk material till I have the handle shape I'm looking for. To make it more comfortable in the hand, I rounded off the edges of the lower handle. Moving to the vice grip of the tongs, I drilled a large hole in the center to give the tongs a sort of grip pattern. Then I drilled a second hole to mark the end of the gripping head. <laughs> 
Sawing from the top hole to the lower one will give me a clean division between the clamps of the tongs. And now that that's done, I can split the body of the plank with an axe to divide it into two arms joined at the bottom. Yet another hole near the base will halt the split at least to some degree. This gives me a chance to drive through some dowel pins and to wind it in wire so that even if it splits all the way through, the tongs won't fall apart. This copper winding will provide a lot of compression strength to the base and prevent it from splitting, but I need to make sure it's very tight, so I pounded the windings down with a hammer. Once that's done, all that's left to do is to saw out the inside of the arms, thinning them down enough to have a nice light spring so that I can open and close them with only one hand. With that, the tongs are complete. A quick test shows that even in my clumsy hands, they're quite nimble and can handle picking up a tricky piece of metal while maintaining a nice tight grip, easily loosened by a little thumb pressure to the arms of the tongs. I'm certain I'll want an array of metal blacksmithing tongs as soon as I start smithing in earnest, but this will be enough to get me started. Now, I need to make arguably the most important part of the furge, the blowpipe. It's essentially a straw that will let me blow on the furge fire to invigorate the flame. It's what will make the difference between a smoldering fire and that lava-like inferno we're actually going for. The Egyptian murals depict Nile reeds being used for this task, but I don't live near the Nile, so I'm going to use a branch of a polonia tree. It's an invasive species in my area that grows naturally with a hole running through the center of the wood, similar to a reed. There are numerous ways of aspirating a furge, and throughout history we have evidence of everything from ceramic pot bellows operated by the feet, to bag bellows made from simple sacks or hides, all the way to complex wooden box bellows that act with pistons. However, the mural of Nibemann depicts a blowpipe, so that's what I intend to use. It's by far the simplest way to aspirate a furge, and I'm very interested in seeing if it will actually work for my design. There's something sort of romantic and elegantly simple about using your own lungs to breathe life into the fire. Perhaps the best bellows is really the one nature gave you. And the fact that the Egyptians used this technique despite knowing about multiple other firms of bellows technology seems like good evidence that it must have some viability when compared to the more complex solutions. But we'll have to wait till the furge is finished to see if it works for a person who lacks the lung capacity of an opera singer. Unlike the tongs, a quick dip in water won't be enough for the blowpipe, as it will be continuously in close proximity to Hephaestus's white-hot flame while I bring the metal to temperature. It will need a clay toyer, or nozzle, to protect the wood from the flame. This will be molded on while the clay is wet, so for now I'll just carve down the end of the pipe till it's a nice shape to accept a pointed nozzle as seen in the Egyptian murals. 
My wooden blowpipe is much thicker than the reeds the Egyptians used, but if the murals are accurate, it's about the same length compared to my arm, and the wood is exceptionally light and soft, similar to balsa wood, and feels nice in my hand and not too heavy that I'd mind holding it up for long durations while I heat the metal. I decided to etch some simple patterning into my blowpipe to make it just a little prettier than a plain old wood tube. In the same way I think our society overlooks the capabilities of past cultures' technology, I think it also dismisses the value of their art and decoration. Even the earliest Stone Age artifacts show a significant dedication of time to decoration for even common household items, and that trend persisted throughout all of history until industrialization and the loss of artisans. A simple engraving makes the piece my own. The hand-carved surface feels unique, and all in all I find the tool pretty in a way that makes me feel a little extra happy to have it in my hands. It's certainly something I'll want to take care of. And after carving, I gave it a water-based ink stain and painted in the engravings with thicker ink to make them stand out. I like the look, and with that, the blowpipe is finished. Now that we've had our fun with woodworking, the pieces of the forge are dry and ready to fire. If you're like me, you've probably thought for your whole life that you need a specialized kiln to fire pottery. But what I've learned while studying for the Scrapcraft project is that nothing more than a campfire is required to fire terracotta. In fact, there were periods of time in history when people fired their pottery in the same fires they cooked on. Well, a regular campfire would work fine. Putting the fire in a deep pit like this will make it more efficient and safer. In fact, depending on where you live, pit firings can be considered safe enough to be exempt from regular seasonal fire rules. The Egyptians had many different kiln designs, and kilns are as much an ancient technology worthy of study as the forge itself. Many Egyptian kilns were built like this, in pits, but quite ingeniously, many were built facing into the wind, as to naturally aspirate the fire, something I neglected to do while building this one. Once heated by the fire to drive off residual moisture, I'm going to place my parts directly into the flame. Not only will this result in a nice direct heating, but it will also make for carbon patterns in the pottery that I find really beautiful. That said, the Egyptians had their kilns down to a science, and even very small kilns of this size could be enclosed with a sort of chimney formed out of terracotta, like a large pot. This Egyptian pot kiln would have had a perforated shelf to hold the wares that allowed moderately efficient heating without creating the carbon patterns. This made for nice, clean pottery and enabled the firing of some of their beautiful non-clay ceramics, such as Egyptian faience, which I hope to experiment in making soon. My parts were too large to all fire at once, so I did multiple firings, though none were very long and I got them all done in one day. Piece by piece, my forge took shape, and with each one my eagerness to try the forge grew greater, till I was practically shivering with excitement. Out of five pieces, only one broke during firing, and it was because I carelessly smacked it with a piece of wood. Luckily, the way it broke won't have any effect on the overall forge, and I'm ecstatic with how it turned out. Bringing the final piece out of the fire is a good chance to highlight the interesting chemistry of red clay. The iron is reduced during the firing, and loses the oxygen molecules that make it rust red, leaving the fired part looking sandy tan. But as the hot part cools in the open air, the atmosphere oxidizes the iron back to a pretty red-orange color. To show that the pieces are evenly fired, I listen to the sound each piece made when flicking. The hollow metallic drum is typical of this unrefined brick earth terracotta, whereas something nicer, like levigated clay with charcoal temper, will ring like a wine glass when tapped with a spoon. Before I can start using the forge, I need one more crucial ingredient. Fuel. In this case, charcoal. When trees and plants grow, they use the energy of sunlight in a chain of oxidation reduction reactions to join water from the earth with carbon from the air to form sugars like glucose, which get stitched together into long chains called cellulose, which is what wood and most plant matter is primarily made of. This means primarily wood is composed of carbon and water. When wood is burned, Oxidation and reduction reactions occur, which reverse those of photosynthesis, and release that same energy captured from sunlight, 
and reform the carbon in water. The formation of carbon dioxide and the formation of water release huge quantities of energy, which is what makes fire hot. But breaking apart the sugars to form those chemicals requires a lot of energy, and happens imperfectly, leading to byproducts in the flame which convert its thermal energy into light. This makes wood fire bright and beautiful, and easy to light, but saps energy from the flame, and to reach the temperatures required by the crafts of Hephaestus, we need to prevent this from happening. Essentially, what we want to do is to take apart whatever we're using to make charcoal and remove the water from the chemical structure, leaving behind only the carbon. Elemental fuels like carbon enable insanely high temperatures, but how can we achieve such a thing? It may sound complex, but it's actually very simple. We like to think of the universe as being this static, stable, and uniform thing that is as it appears. We see the wood as being a distinct thing unique from the water it's composed of. But really, the universe is chaotic and more dynamic than it seems, and wood, like all matter, is sort of a fluid in its existence. It prefers to exist this way in its current contexts, but in a different context, it will prefer to exist as liquid water and solid carbon just like how ice on a cold morning is water in the warm evening. All I need to make charcoal is to alter the context of the universe to increase the entropy of the cellulose. Then it will release the water all by itself. In this case, my source of cellulose is walnut shell. It's abundant around here and is incredibly dense. I don't need the nut and others can benefit from that, so I try to seek out mainly hollow or already broken shells. You may have noticed this old ammo can I found in the woods in some of the earlier shots. It's what will contain my shells while they're converted into charcoal. In ancient history, most charcoal was made in large piles called clamps that provided charcoal for whole communities at a time. But as I'm only serving myself, this will do fine for my needs. The purpose of the can is to prevent oxygen from reaching the shells. This allows me to increase their temperature without burning, which increases the entropy and allows a whole lot of thermochemistry to take place. The lip of the ammo can lid will allow the water liberated to escape as steam along with other wood gas byproducts, preventing them from building up in the can and causing an explosion. The byproducts burn in the fire, and actually contribute heat to sustaining the reaction. I hope to do more with this principle in the future, but for now, I heat the can in the same kiln I fired my forge bricks in, and use the fire to cook some meals for myself. This saves some energy and hits two birds with one stone. I should also take this time to mention that wood wasn't necessarily the fuel used in ancient times to fire ceramics or perform other tasks. To my knowledge, dried manure was more popular for ceramics in many cultures, and a wide diversity of fuels are employed for different purposes, never over-relying on one source of energy. The people of our past were extremely resourceful, in a way I think we modern makers could frequently benefit from emulating. I made a few batches of charcoal this way and after each was finished, I poured the contents of the can into a bag for storage. The walnut charcoal has retained the original shape of the nuts, but having lost most of its mass to the liberated water is a shrunken carbon copy of its firmer self. Comparing this uncarbonized shell to this charcoal shell really highlights the difference, and on a scale I can confirm that the charcoal is less than half the mass, the untouched nut weighing around 5 grams, and the charcoal weighing only 2. It seems counterintuitive that with less fuel mass, this fuel will be able to burn hotter. And it's true that there's more potential chemical energy in the untouched shell, quite a bit more. But the fact that one is almost pure elemental fuel makes all the difference in how I'm able to actually access that energy. Now I can finally say I have everything I need to activate the ancient forge. I'd very much like to start casting bronze and smithing metal right away. Unfortunately, while I have the requisite materials to power the forge up, I don't necessarily have the knowledge or skills to actually use it properly. I start by applying the wet clay toy air to the end of my blowpipe. The clay I'm using is some leftover unrefined brick earth, which was honestly lazy of me, as it probably would have been better to refine this clay first. After firming my nozzle, it's finally time to actually fire up the forge. I built a small wood fire in the center of the forge and placed some charcoal around it. The way that wood disintegrates into a flame as it burns makes it easier to light than charcoal, which has a much more subtle flame with the burn happening at the surface of the fuel. Once the fire is going nicely, blowing on it will light the nearest coals, and with that, 
the forge is lit, and I can let the wood fire die out, as from this point, it's only charcoal. Now comes the real challenge, getting the forge up to temperature. I don't know how the ancient Egyptians started their forge fires, or how long it took them to heat up. I don't have any instructions for this, so the only way I know if I'm doing it wrong is my own judgment. The Egyptians could be efficient. Its clear chisels and adzes are elegant tools that require only a little effort to use with mediums like wood. But they could also be crazy and made labor-intensive objects like elaborate stone jugs hollowed out through grinding by hand, or the most obvious example of labor-intensive work, the construction of the Great Pyramids themselves. Whether blowpipe verging is an example of the former or the latter is a question I can only answer if the forge works without me first dying of exhaustion. At the outset, I was optimistic, but as time wore on, and the charcoal remained at only a smoldering red glow, I began to have doubts. Three quarters of an hour in, and it seemed like I was blowing more than I was breathing, and I was getting nowhere for it. I began to get light-headed, and was feeling as though the whole mural of Nibamun was a work of fiction. The wet nozzle required constant soaking, and refirming to heal cracks that firmed while being held close to the fire. I had no idea if my firm was wrong, or if maybe I was blowing the wrong way, or even if my charcoal was the wrong shape and size. I would try something different, wait a few minutes, and still see no change. Finally, out of desperation, while smoothing the nozzle, I tried pinching the end of the nozzle down to a more narrow diameter. I honestly thought this would probably just to make things worse. But as I began to blow, the fire roared to life. The coals began to glow brighter, and brighter still. The hunk of iron I placed in the forge as a gauge of temperature began to glow red, then orange, and finally I could see it begin to glow yellow deep inside the coals. This is the Hephaestus level heat I was searching for. The coals are starting to resemble lava, and the iron is starting to soften. But unfortunately, just as I was reaching this temperature, the nozzle crumbled to bits, as in my excitement, I had forgotten to rehydrate it. Regardless, this was my eureka moment. The constricted nozzle converted the pressure of my lungs into velocity, accelerating the air into a jet stream. That night, I formed a couple nozzles from Brick Earth to further test this theory, and a few days later I fired them to make them permanent and adhered them to the blowpipe with flour paste. One shattered right away, accidentally, when I started using it, so I repaired it with more of the flour paste. This worked phenomenally, actually, but looked very ugly. This high-velocity air appears to be well-suited for aspirating the flame, and not only that, but it's much, much easier to blow with than it was with the wider nozzle. With the tight nozzle providing back pressure, I can keep air in my lungs and my cheeks full, which is much less tiring than the open pipe that exhausts my whole body's air reservoir almost immediately. Keeping the cheeks full may seem like a strange distinction, but it opens up the possibility of circular breathing. Circular breathing, which in today's day is typically only used by woodwind musicians to sustain long notes, is a technique that allows you to blow out continuously, even while breathing in. This may sound impossible, but it hinges on the fact that you can fill your cheeks with air and then contract them to blow out your mouth, while breathing in through your nose using your diaphragm muscle. I personally cannot yet circular breathe, but with practice I hope to be able to soon. I'm not sure how much of a difference it would make, but it's possible it could reduce the amount of time required to bring the metal to heat. Much more recently than the ancients, but still historically, circular breathing was used to aspirate a very different kind of blowpipe in chemistry labs. Michael Faraday and other scientists of his time would use very small metal blowpipes in conjunction with candles or spirit lamps to melt small amounts of metal or perform very delicate operations at very high temperatures. I've actually used this technique in the past to braise copper with a candle. This is where the term blowtorch comes from, and Faraday describes the process of circular breathing for blowtorches in his book Chemical Manipulation. 
Again, this example is most certainly not ancient, but it's very possible that the ancients figured out this technique, so I feel it's worth experimenting with. After months of research and construction, I found it really encouraging seeing the charcoal glowing yellow and watching the iron catch up with it. However, it's clear this device has a number of learning curves to it, and even after weeks of trying, I'm still working on refinements to the design and workshopping my techniques for using it. I know it can get hotter, and I intend to keep working till it gets there. That said, I'm going to end this video here, but I hope to have a follow-up video soon as I continue to develop on these ideas. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please like and subscribe. YouTube is very new to me, and this format is experimental, so please tell me in the comments what you like and don't like. It's a learning process, but I'll do my best to make each video better than the last. Thank you, and bye!